Video number five in this series looks at dead time. So the previous four videos have introduced the core concepts of predictive functional control for tracking constant targets. And the basic idea is to choose the current input such that the output prediction n samples ahead matches a target trajectory with the desired closed loop dynamics. And the key advantage of PSC compared to, say, PID, is that it can cater for dead time in a systematic fashion. So this video is going to show how that works. Some reminders then. This is how PFC works. If you haven't got a dead time, you set yourself a desired target. And here you'll see the target has been given in a black line. And that's a first order dynamic from the current point to the steady state. You choose a particular coincidence horizon. Here we've chosen five seconds. And you make the output prediction match the target at that coincidence point. So that's given by this equation here. You can see the output prediction n steps ahead matches the target, which is this expression over here. Now, within this expression, there's a lambda. And just a reminder that that lambda is the discrete pole equivalent of a desired closed loop settling time. And they're linked by this expression here. Now, what do you do if there's a dead time? And you can see I've got a problem here because I've got a target. Here it's in black. And I've got a system step response, which is here given in red. And I've said I want these two to coincide at this point here. And you can see immediately this is just not possible. OK, it's impossible to get coincidence if the coincidence time is less than six seconds, because this system has got a dead time of six seconds. So what do I do now? PFC seems to have a problem. So the basic law fails in the case where a system has a dead time m. And in particular, if you write this formula here, the key issue is that if n is small, and specifically if it's smaller than m, then the predicted impact of the current input choice uk on the predicted output is zero. So you can see immediately n has to be bigger than m. Otherwise, the degree of freedom you're giving yourself has no impact at all on the coincidence point. So in that case, we couldn't use UK to enforce the desired coincidence. So a simple proposal might be to shift the target by the same number of samples of the dead time. So you see what I've done here is I've taken this black target and I've just shifted it to the right to give myself this green target. So you could say, would it make more sense just to use a delayed target? So that's what I've got here. And then move the coincidence beyond the delay. Now, there are many reasons, actually, why this doesn't work particularly well. And it's just here to get you to think. But what I'm going to say is this idea doesn't work particularly well because it embeds the dead time in the response in a bad way. So the weakness of delaying the target is that a delayed response is embedded. And more specifically, you're going to embed that dead time into the closed loop dynamics and give yourselves lots of problems with sensitivity. So if we know the system has a delay, we could achieve an undelayed response by using anticipation and supplying tracking information earlier. But what we're going to do is actually make a clever use of the independent model so that we can avoid embedding this delay time into the closed loop um, transfer functions and therefore into the sensitivity functions. So what we're going to do is we're going to use PFC to control a delay free model. So we get the delay out of the system by controlling the model and not the process. And then we form an offset term which is used to correct for a basically offset against the process. This then is our updated block diagram. You can see that the process has effectively got a dead time within it, but the model does not. 
the model has no dead time. So we don't try and match the dead time in the model to the process. We keep the delay out. But then what we do is we say, OK, if we want to compare the model output with the process output, we need to put the delay back in. So you can see that this term over here, dm, represents the offset between the process and the model because they've both got equivalent delays. So we've got a delay-free model output ym and we've got our bias term is now going to be yp at sample k minus ym at sample k minus m. And this is the key trick that we're going to use, that this updated bias term uses a process at the current sample but an old version of the model output. So we're going to design the PFC law <coughs> so that the unbiased and, here's a keyword, undelayed predictor output tracks the output. So what we do is we correct the model prediction with the most up-to-date, and that's the key thing, the most up-to-date estimate of bias, which was what was on the previous slide. So we're going to say that the model n samples ahead plus the most updated bias, and I'm going to give this a shorthand, YPM, is the same as the expected value of the process M plus N samples into the future. So there's the key thing. So if we take the model N samples ahead and correct it with this bias term, that gives us the expected process M plus N samples ahead. Now, what I can do is I can actually write expressions for this prediction explicitly because it's based upon the model. So you can see here we have model predictions going n samples ahead and at the end here we have the bias term. Okay, so there's your model prediction which is exactly the same as in earlier videos and you'll see there's no delay anywhere in that expression. The only place that the delay comes in is in the up-to-date bias. You'll see there's delay between the yp term and the ym term. And so what we're using for our prediction is not an exact process prediction because it's a mixture of a model n steps ahead and a bias term which used a delay. What about the target? Well the target is now going to be based because we're going to try and control the model on the undelayed model so we don't need to delay the target. So here we go. We're going to write that the target n samples ahead is basically going to be based upon the expected value of the process m samples ahead. So you'll notice if you look at this expression, the difference between the target expression we've got here and the one we've used historically is we've got the expected value of ypk plus m here rather than just ypk. So the expected value m steps ahead so that we're taking the delay out of the process. However, we happen to know that the expected value of the process m samples ahead is the same as the model, the current value of the model, plus this bias term. So therefore, if we plug that in, then what we end up with is a new expression for our target which is this expression here. Now it looks a lot messier, but if you just keep your head clear, all we've done is replace ypk plus the, by the expected value of ypk plus m. So now we can combine these two equations for prediction and the target. So you can see this one is the prediction equation. This one is the target equation. And all we're going to do, as ever before, is make those two terms the same. So when you do that, it does come out to be quite a long expression. But if you just remember that the conceptual steps are very simple. You're just writing, here's the expression for my prediction. Here's the expression for the target. Make the two the same. 
Now there are a number of simple cancellations that you can do. I'm not going to do those um, with you in detail because you can pause the video and you can do that yourself. But you can see, for example, there's a YPK there and there's a minus YPK there, etc., etc. And so there are lots of opportunities to combine terms and make this a little simpler. And I'm just going to write the result. So what you find is you get this term here, R minus ymk minus ypk plus ymk minus m and what you'll notice is that the term in, in there that's effectively equivalent to r minus the expected value of ypk plus m that in essence is what is in that box and that's multiplied by 1 minus lambda to the n and then on the right hand side you've just got your model prediction you'll see that this bit here is just y m k plus m. Now there is an alternative development which is a slightly simple algebra which we'll give in video 7 but we don't want to do that until obviously we've gone through the normal derivation. So a numerical example to show that this works. The examples are in here video 1 underscore 5 pfc ex1 which is on the Google site. Here are the G's. You see, again, we've put in parameter uncertainty um, deliberately, and you'll notice that we've put a delay into the process. So, example one, we've chosen lambda is 0.8, n equals 1, and a delay of three samples. And what do you notice about your output? The output here is, is this black line, and you can see the output has got nice behavior. Um, is fairly close to the dynamic you want, <coughs> which is the lambda equals 0 0.8. And critically, you can see the delay of three samples is fairly obvious stated there. The delay is embedded, but we've still got a nice response and offset free tracking. If we change lambda and n, you find everything still works. No problem. Change lambda and n again. Here you'll notice we've made the delay as big as five samples. And you'll see with this simple fix, PFC works as if there was no delay. Everything looks fine. You look at these output responses and you say, yep, they're converging quite nicely. So we've demonstrated that an elementary PFC algorithm deals with dead time in an easy and systematic fashion. The key modification is to make good use of predictions from the independent model, but ensure these are corrected for the most up-to-date bias estimate. So in essence, we control the model, use PFC to control the model, but we make sure that the predictions of the model are corrected by this bias term. We've given some examples with parameter uncertainty and large dead times and demonstrated it works well, despite it being very simple.